Before the next episode of XJob Downloaded starts, I have a big favour to ask. If you've enjoyed any of our episodes so far, please can you click on the follow button on your platform. I'm on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon and YouTube. It costs nothing to follow, but makes a real difference to me as a podcast producer. Thank you. My name is Paul Maleri and this is X Job Downloaded. And today we're going to interview Michael Sutton. Now, Mike was a member of the Royal Air Force. He was a squadron leader for the, I don't know whether I should call it elite, Mike, but uh, one squadron. Is that is that right? Is that how I say it? Uh, yeah, I was a commanding officer of one squadron. Yes, yeah, so I was a wing commander in the Air Force in charge of one squadron that flew typhoons. Wow. I mean, that is... I'm in awe. I've got to be honest with you, and I think that people listening to this um, will be as well. And I've I've known you and your family for a long time, and um, it's bizarre that the the lad that used to play cricket in my father-in-law's back garden goes on to do such a fantastic and exciting job. But where did it all begin? Where were you born? What, you know, talk us through that. Well, that I mean, that's really kind, and I I think I just got lucky to be honest. Um, but yeah, I grew up in Wiltshire, and obviously. <clears throat> um, you know, our family sort of knew each other through the world of hockey. I was always quite sporty when I was growing up, played hockey, bit of cricket, that sort of stuff, um, and really enjoyed that, the team sports mentality. And actually, that's something that, um, strange enough, I found in the flying world. Um, and I think it's quite unique to fast jet squadrons that you have uh, a really close bond between a relatively small team of people um that in when people think of flying they think of commercial airliners or transport aircraft and they generally operate by themselves and they've got you know a couple of pilots in the cockpit but on a fighter squadron you've got a really close-knit bunch of people and i think that um growing up as a schoolboy, that kind of team environment and challenging sporty sort of energetic environment was something that i found in the air force if you like almost by accident yeah, yeah i grew up in wiltshire um, went to school uh, near Devizes, a place called Dauncey's, and then went off to university to study philosophy, which is uh, slightly unusual, but the Air Force weren't specific about the sort of degrees that they wanted. And so that was pretty good because that was um, not, let's say, not the most demanding degree in the world <laughs> at sort of six hours a week. And it meant I could go and learn how to fly. So I joined the University Air Squadron, um, flying out of Boscombe Down, which is an air base in Wiltshire, on the little piston engine aircraft and that's really where I, I got into it and found that it was something I was really interested in and wanted to pursue as a career. That's fantastic. I mean, your, your, your dad, as you say, he was, he was a massive hockey man and, and sadly he, he passed away a couple of years ago. But And I know the old boy next door, he's nearly 90, he's immensely proud of you and I know your father would be as well. But your your uh, your hockey and your work ethos is, is so huge. I mean, philosophy, there's a massive paradox there. Mike, between doing philosophy and then getting a degree in military planning. I mean, how how do you work those two out? Because it just does seem such a massive void between them. There is a bit of a, a void, isn't there? I, I was much more, um, I was much better at sort of English and reading and that sort of stuff at school um, than maths and science. And I, I, I struggled a bit with all, all of that, which people again, thinks a bit ironic when it comes to flying aeroplanes because you do need a degree of maths. So my mental arithmetic is okay. But my daughter's 14 now and she does maths that I can't even begin to comprehend <laughs> all these equations and things. It just baffles me. So I, I went into philosophy because it was a bit like English and it, it sounded like quite good fun. <laughs> I thought also the course would be full of um, uh, women. And um, I, it was you know, that's one of the biggest mistakes when I walk into this lecture room and there are 150 people in there and uh, there are 147 blokes sort of staring back at me. So that was that was one of my many misjudgments in life. Fantastic. But I, I quite enjoyed the philosophy. Um, I mean, really, it's, it's for people who don't know much about it, you know, you're studying text and it's it actually means a study of wisdom. Right. And what it what it means, what it meant later on was that you can analyse things a little bit. You could, risk, you know, reach a position on 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 fairly complex issues in and, and analyze and then when i came to do 
I did a couple of degrees later on in, in the Air Force, international relations and sort of leadership and um, and some tactical planning. And then I, I actually went on to do a job in strategic planning. And funnily enough, having a grounding in philosophy, being able to assimilate information, analyze it a little bit um, and form arguments and, and, and generate sort of um, policy positions on things. Strangely, actually, the philosophy came in into its own a little bit there, whereas maybe um, engineering would have offered something slightly different. So, yeah, in a strange way, the philosophy was maybe a bit more helpful than I thought it might be when I was 18 and fresh faced at university. Yeah. So you've done three years at university, you've got your degree and you're flying whilst you're at university. Was it, yes, right. was it a natural so, progression to go into the RAF or was the commercial world calling out to you? I actually applied to the Air Force after school. Um, I was one of these kids that's quite young for his year, <clears throat> for their year. So I, I finished school, I was still 17 um, and I applied for the Air Force and went up to Cranwell where you do uh, pilot selection. And that's um, about three days of tests, computer-based tests and group exercises bit of maths um they stick you in a hangar and you do some leadership um sort of challenges with uh trying to pretend to sort of cross a river using planks and all that sort of stuff and uh, i didn't get in so th I, I did the selection and um the air force said well thanks very much you know you've got a bit of promise but you need to go away and put a few hairs on your chest <laughs> um and, and and really grow up a little bit and that's where university was great um and I was very much a schoolboy when I left school and and the three years at university meant that I could try my hand at flying, see if I had a bit of aptitude for it, and then um, get exposed to some of the RF life, the University Air Squadron, which is a fantastic organization where you, you get to fly from a military base, you have instruction from current Royal Air Force pilots, you're getting fantastic instruction. You get put through a training syllabus, and if you if you do all right at that, you can go back to the Air Force. And I guess you're a little bit of a less risky option for them because they know that you've already seen the world. You know that you've got a bit of aptitude for it. And so halfway through university, I went back to the RF and and applied again. And um, luckily enough, I, I got in, and they gave me a a bursary, which is a, a, a small amount of money. Uh, which I immediately spent on a motorbike, much to my mum's <laughs> horror, um, and finished university and then joined the Air, Air Force after that. I, I did apply to British Airways at the same time because they were running a cadetship scheme at the time. Right. Um, and I thought long and hard about, you know, which might be the better route, but I was persuaded that um, the Air Force would be much more exciting, so I ended up going down that line. Fantastic. And what did you start on? What aircraft did you actually – when you were at university, you were on a small propeller – type plane ICM. I mean, I'm making assumptions here, but what, what did you start on? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So flying training's broken down into various segments. It's quite a long process. It takes between four and sort of seven years to get to your first squadron uh, as a fast jet pilot. And when you reach the squadron, that's not the end of the training. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's the beginning, I guess, it, the equivalent, you know, would be in you're now a junior doctor, if you like, but you're still a long way off being a consultant. Yeah. Um, so the, the the sort of training process is is quite long winded, and it's broken down into various phases. The first phase is called elementary flying training. So um, that's flying a light aircraft. It's a uh, it was called a bulldog. They've moved on a bit now. That the, the bulldogs have been retired, but it had a 200 horsepower engine. You sat side by side with your parachutes, and it was a fully aerobatic aeroplane. And you were taught the basics of military flying. So it started off with how to do takeoffs and landings and, and a bit of basic navigation. Um, then you'd move on to uh, formation flying. And we do up to four uh, Bulldogs flying uh, in close formation. Then you do some low level navigation, um, instrument flying and, and aerobatics as well. So loops and barrel rolls and and they teach you how to do all, all of that stuff to a, a, a pretty good standard. You get about a hundred hours on that. And uh, if you pass that course, then you could move on to the next stage. Um, after that, if you're successful, then you move on to a plane uh, called the Tucano, or I did. Again, that's another plane that's been replaced with something similar, but a bit more modern these days. And that was essentially a, um, a, a halfway house between a, a small piston engine airplane and a jet. And this thing would rattle on at about 240 to 300 knots. And you'd... 
Um, you do a residential course there up at, it was at RF Lintel News up in Yorkshire. There'll be a course of 15 of you. There will be several courses on the squadron. And so you've got a, a training base with about 100 trainee pilots, all about 21, all getting paid for the first time and buying their first cars and rattling around in these aeroplanes and terrorizing the North York Moors with their new found low level skills. And it would be the same um, similar flying, but just um, taken up a notch. So you now introduce more G-forces, more complex navigation. You'd be let loose at this point to take off from Yorkshire, fly over the Lake District or up to Scotland on your own at low level. You'd be given simulated targets where you had to fly over a certain point to within a, a five seconds and that was your aim and you had to navigate yourself around um, and that course lasted about another 100 hour, 120 hours and, and a year and for those that passed that course then you'd move on to the hawk which is a plane that everyone knows from the red arrows right and the hawk t1 and that was the first time you got near a you know a proper fighter um <clears throat> the chop rate on the flying training was around about 50 percent so there was obviously, you know, a degree of competition to sort of get there in the first place. But from the people who started on day one, about half the people made it through. And so throughout these courses, uh, there was this attrition. And you're always very aware that um, the friends that you started with, not everyone would finish the course. That's hard. Uh, and so that there was um, a, a huge amount of pressure for each flight that you did, you were assessed. Yep. And you have a, a, a report written down on you that would be um, about, a, about a side of A4. It, it would assess everything from how, how well you knew your checks, your radio calls, your situational awareness, your fuel management, and then the actual elements of the flying as well that you were doing on that particular day. And then you'd, you get a score at the end of this, and it was a naught to a six. And a naught was a dismal failure, and a six was almost unachievably high. Right. Um, so you needed to be getting your threes and fours, and that and that meant you were on track to be passing. Um, if you if you didn't pass a trip, uh, you got a two, and that meant you'd refly it, and that would happen occasionally. Um, and then if you had a couple of twos, you'd be put onto a thing called review, where you get a little bit of remedial flying. But really, if you if you had a couple, two or three trips that you didn't pass, that was it. And so people went from doing absolutely fine on the course to 10 days later being removed from training and 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 that was the end of it. So do so, they go on, sorry, Michael, do they go on to other aircraft or is that literally the end of their flying career? Normally, they would go on to other aircraft that right. were maybe a little bit less demanding to fly. Yep. Sometimes that would be the end of their career, sort of depending on what stage they got to. Yep. But quite often people would... If they didn't, if they if they didn't pass a flying course, they'd maybe go from flying the Hawk, uh, not get through it. Then they might find themselves on a Hercules, or perhaps they go and fly helicopters or something like that. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So if you pass the Decanos, you're off to uh, the Hawk. And for me, it was um, there was a backlog in the UK, and so the UK uh, bought into um, a flying school in Canada called the NATO Flying Training School. And myself and a colleague were really lucky and we went out there uh, for a year. And the RF pushed about 20 people through, I think, over over the next few years. But we were first out there, which was a great opportunity. I remember being called into my chief instructor's office at the end of the Takano and he said, right, you've passed, uh, you're off to the Hawk, but you can go to Canada if you want, but it's a year and you need to go next week. Are you up for it? And I uh, said, yep, I can get my bags. <laughs> and then we flew out to a place called Moose Jaw in Saskatchewan, which is in the middle of Canada. And it's probably a place you've not many people would have heard of, uh, but there's been a flying school there for a while and <clears throat> in the middle of the prairies. And we got stuck into these brand new hawks. I remember arriving there um, and there was still a bit of snow on the ground, crystal blue skies and just flat terrain like you've never seen the wow. roads there you can drive for an hour without having to turn a corner wow. you know it's sort of extraordinary landscape and hawks in the hangar these hawks had about five or ten flying hours on them so it's like getting into a, a showroom of ferraris you know just brand new airplanes um and, and getting into these and then learning how to fly at 400 miles an hour um or, or quicker actually on occasion wow and that's when that's when it got really interesting and and really quick because um, 
you're flying at seven miles a minute. And when you're flying at low level, it means you can, you, you know, you're crossing huge swathes of country very, very quickly. And if you start getting lost, you get lost very quickly indeed. Yeah, it's not, you can't put the brakes on, can you? You can't, oh, shall I just, that, that must be absolutely amazing. I can't even imagine going that fast. Yeah, it's it's an incredible um, it's an incredible thing. It, it's you 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 get used to it in in a strange way. It's like just operating in a slightly different dimension. So your whole um, your whole scale changes. And um, I mean, I, I guess the last flying I did was from the Typhoon. But you get so used to getting airborne from Lossiemouth, which is right in the north of Scotland. And to get where you need to get to over the North Sea, you'd just point just south of Aberdeen on a heading and you'd go and it would be 100 miles and it would take you about sort of 10 minutes to get there. So the the sort of the scale and the decision making and the timings that you're using are, are, are very different than, yeah. than when you're driving around in a car. But when you're learning it, by God, things happen quickly. Oh, yeah. And you're coming back into an airfield um, at that sort of speed um you're 20 miles away from it but that's only three minutes and in all of that time you've got to do all recovery checks you've got to get aircraft back together um you're doing all sort of systems briefings and fuel checks and radio calls you add a bit of weather into it which makes it complex as well when you're skirting around thunderstorms and things and so you're always trying to think ahead you're always five minutes ahead and the instructors are always um saying to you don't get behind the aircraft there's no time to fuss or, or worry about something, or, you know, you, you've just got to be thinking, what's next, what's next, what's next? Um, and it's a mindset that, that um, pilots get into. Um, and that they're always, they're always trying to stay ahead of the aeroplane, get the next job done. What's the next thing that's going to catch me out? Because that's the only way that you can fly these things around at Mach 1 and, and not get caught out. And what's that like on your body? I mean, to, to fly, I mean, we'll, we'll move in... It's... Let me go back a little bit. So you, you're you're out in Canada and you, you're doing your, your training there. You're there for a year, which is which is fun, but it's tough because you are away. And but you must be thinking, what year? What year was this? What year were you? This was um, 2002. So the second Iraq war was well. So I was out there. No, in fact, it was 2001 right. because um, 9/11 happened when I was there. Wow. And so this is when the world changed. Yeah. And um, I remember when I was at Cranwell doing my officer training, which is the six months of um, square bashing and, and drill and a little bit of leadership and all of those sort of things that get you into the military mindset. We were all ushered into a room one day, a hundred of us on the course, and, there, and it was a secret briefing. And we were given this sort of threat update of what was happening around the world. And it, it, none of it was particularly you know, controversial or interesting, but they said the greatest threat to service people now is um, from animal rights activists. Yeah. So I think the IRA had started to calm down a bit, and so that wasn't so much of a threat. We were allowed to wear our uniform outside the base, so that was a change. Yeah. And so I was thinking, well, animal rights activists, I mean, I, they were um, being violent, and, and, you know, that was obviously the primary threat to the UK at the time. And I cracked on with flying training and we were all thinking, well, this is all great. We're not quite sure where the next war is going to come from. Um, but we're all 21 and just thoroughly enjoying the whole process of training. And then one day in Canada, I remember we all lived in a big accommodation block, a bit like a halls of residence, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and a mate knock on my door and saying, turn the TV on. Um, look, look what's happened. And it was the Twin Towers. And I distinctly remember going into, into my buddy's room and watching the second aircraft crash into um you know the second of the world trade center buildings yeah. and then the whole base went on to this sort of lockdown and then we're all into work the next day and uh, i remember the canadians saying they're at defcon 2 or something some oh, it's not a phrase we use in the uk but no. i remember hearing the phrase defcon and thinking this is quite interesting yeah and suddenly everyone went on to high alert and then obviously very quickly after that iran um iraq afghanistan uh, happened and hot on the hills of that Syria. So it went from being not a peaceful world, but a world where the UK wasn't overly involved militarily to suddenly um, up to your eyeballs in it um, fr from 2001 onwards. And it, it's quite interesting. I remember where I was on that on that day. I was working on the murder inquiry of a young lady called Danielle Jones. And I remember the 
getting a phone call from an American friend, exactly the same, you know, put the television on, listen to the radio. And, um, yeah, it was, it was quite bizarre. And the world did change around the, the terrorist threat and, and the conflicts that we were going to get involved in. But what was the Canadian perspective? I mean, there was a massive lockdown. The airspace was locked down completely across North America. Um, the Canadians... Um, there's a relationship between the Canadians and the Americans, which is different to us and the Americans, et cetera, et cetera. But what was that like with the Canadian military? I don't think I can answer that one particularly well because I was just a student on a flying course. Yeah. And so I was quite a long way off the politics at that point. Um, I mean, I think we finished the course um, and then we all got streamed onto our um, our frontline aircraft types that we were going to be going onto so when you finish your flying training course they um uh, they decide where where your best fit is going to be based really on your performance on that course and i was um sent off to the jaguar which is a single seat uh, attack aircraft based over in Nor- uh, norfolk and another one that's now a museum piece sadly yeah but um i went off there i had some colleagues who went off to the tornado which is a two-seat a fighter and there was another variant which is a two-seat bomber uh, and some friends that went off to the harrier and so we all went from our flying training worlds off to our frontline squadrons and then entered a, a combat ready workup period which is where you go from basically a trainee pilot to someone who's um safe enough to operate a frontline aircraft <laughs> and then go and do something with it so you you, you had another on the jaguar it's a nine-month conversion course and then about another four month work up on the squadron itself. So it's about another year after completing fast jet flying training before you're a combat ready junior wingman, essentially. Um, and the politics of the world at the time, I was just young and really just thinking about passing my next trip. Yeah. And you, you're very aware that, that things are happening. I remember reading about the dossier when it came out, the sort of Tony Blair dossier. And then there was a reaction from the RF then, you know, that they might be getting involved. And uh, we already had jets in uh, Turkey that were doing um, a sort of bit of uh, a bit of air policing and reconnaissance yep. uh, from the 1991 uh, Gulf War. And there was a bit of a hangover from that, but it wasn't hugely kinetic. Um, they were being shot at a bit, but um, they weren't really dropping weapons or anything like that. Um, and we, we then got told to prepare for the 2003, um, you know, Iraq war. And the Jaguars were going to be operating out of Inchilik up in uh, Turkey. Yeah. And they were going to be flying strike missions from that. And at the very last moment, um, due to diplomatic reasons, that got pulled on the Turks. So they weren't supporting it. So the Jaguars all flew home. And so there was a, a race to kind of get ready for a big conflict very early in my career. And um, yeah, for those reasons, it, it didn't happen. And then the Jaguars were back at back in the UK carrying on with training. And it was um, the other aircraft types, that the Tornado primarily and the Harriers, that, that kind of got involved in that particular stage of the conflict. And Inchilic is an American airbase, isn't it? Is that... A, or... Yeah, it's, it's an, uh, exactly right. It's on Turkish soil. Um, and then it's primarily an American base there. Yeah. In the same way, they've got Lake and Heath and Milton Hall in the UK. They've got places all over, all over the world. Yeah, they've got places all over the world. And sometimes you get joint operations from them. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes, you know, you've got coalition um, uh, aircraft there. So other countries can fly and use those bases. But the host nation's always got a sort of veto, if you like, yeah. just like, We've got American bases and the government can make decisions about what the Americans do on our soil, even yep. if it's their, even though it's their base, if you like. Um, and uh, yeah, that was the same with Turkey. Hey. So the Jaguars were um, were back from, from the operations. And so my first couple of years flying, the Jaguar was really training. And it, I mean, it was fantastic because we were dropping a lot of live weaponry. We were off the, uh, the ranges off the East Coast and firing rounds and dropping practice weapons and going across to America, dropping lots of big bombs, and, and but all in a training scenario, um, which was a fantastic grounding for what came later in my career. Um, and then about uh, two years after that uh, of, of, of flying around on Jaguars, uh, I then did the tactics instructor course. 
right. which is where you specialize again and you become a um uh, you focus in on on all the tactical elements of flying that particular aircraft type. You become a bit of an expert in the weapon system, how you'd operate it in different um, war scenarios, and then you go back to the front line as a um, as what's called a QI in the UK, a qualified weapons instructor. But that's your primary role then is to be into the weapons and the tactics. And I did that for about a year, and then uh, fortuitous timing because the typhoon came along which was the brand new airplane yep. and the one that everyone was really excited about and that was when i moved um onto that first typhoon squadron that first frontline typhoon squadron as a uh, as as an ex jaguar weapons instructor and immediately took on that job on the typhoon surrounded by people who didn't have any experience on it myself included and we had to start the thing from scratch that's fantastic because I, I watch, you don't see many of them up around here, unless there's an aircraft coming in that stands to, under escort. But um, there, there's such a, a piece of machinery, you just can't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of, of them. When you fly, I'm just going to go back a little bit, when you fly to the States in these aircraft, how many times do you have to refuel? So air-to-air -air refueling is a, it's a really interesting concept and... I don't think anyone really enjoys doing air-to-air -air refueling. No. If they do, they're lying. Um, it's it's a really tricky thing, and people always joke that you're only as good as your last prod because you can <laughs> you can have a really good run for a few months, and then you know it, it's such a challenging thing to do that you can have an absolute shocker and and and, and not manage to connect. The whole concept is you've got a big airliner flying um, that's been modified to be uh, a tanker aircraft some of them can carry passengers as well but the air force has generally got um you know uh, it, it used to be a thing called vc10s and tristars now the voyagers but they're modified a330 so the things that would take you around the world on your holidays yeah these things can carry a lot of spare fuel and the wing has got um a, a kit on it that essentially is an enormous hose that comes out the back that's about 100 foot long and a basket on the back of that and it, it deploys that. And as the aircraft flies along it, it's got this hose in this basket flying behind it. Now, it's all very well if um, there's no turbulence, it's lovely weather, it's a gin clear day, and the aircraft's just flying smoothly, then this snake kind of flies along behind it, if you like. Yeah. And your job as the fighter, uh, because fighters can only fly on average for a couple of hours, a little bit less if you're using a lot of afterburner, and so what you need to do is um, uh, get get a probe out of your aircraft. You make a switch and this sort of arm comes out from beside the cockpit and it's a refueling probe. And then you fly that probe into the basket that's being trailed by the aircraft in front at about 300 miles an hour. And then you'll make contact with the basket. So you'll fly between into the basket, push it forward a few feet, and then fuel flows from the aircraft in front in front into your aircraft and then you top up with fuel so that's the theory um i used to teach this stuff and you sit in the back of the two seaters and watch the new guys do it um and it's it's a it's the ultimate mix between art and science and you can brief people how to do it and they can kind of watch videos okay okay i've got it but it's only until you've done it lots of times that you start to generate confidence with this the basket itself, as it's being dragged along at 300 miles an hour, um, when that gets close to the front of your aircraft, your aircraft is pushing all the air out the way at 300 miles an hour as well. So it creates a kind of bow wave, a bit like when a leaf comes towards the front of your windscreen, then it yep. shoots across. It doesn't make him. So when you're driving towards the basket to connect, you've actually got to aim to miss because when you get close, the basket moves up and away by several feet. And then... So you're aiming where you think the basket's going to be. And what people do is they miss. They, it's called lunging, which is not encouraged. People will sort of um, drive in a bit quickly to this thing, maybe miss the basket. They'll hit the edge of it. They might damage their probe. They might damage the basket. As soon as you start doing this, when there's turbulence around, it's a bit like a whip. So the wing of the Voyager will move up and down in turbulence. And then a bit like a whip, the, the sort of, you know, the hose itself flexes more and more. So the basket ends up going up and down. And so you're chasing this moving target that can sometimes be moving up and down by, you know, 10 or 20 feet. And then 
on some horrendous nights over a rack with thunderstorms, I've seen the basket just flinging itself around. Um, and then you take away all the light as well and you start doing this at night time um, in and out of cloud. And the whole thing can become fairly emotional. <laughs> but getting across the Atlantic, to go back to your original question, um, you would normally fly um, for about sort of four or five hours and then you'd, you'd tank maybe two or three times, right. something like that. You you never want, when you're doing an Atlantic crossing, you never want to get to a point where you've got no fuel um, to get to another runway. So you don't want to expose yourself uh, to a point where maybe you have a fuel system failure and it doesn't work. So you're, you're sort of topping up and you get to these um, these points where you either need to fill up to this amount of fuel or you need to turn around to where you've got back to. Oh. Um, so you fly a slightly strange route in a fast jet. You don't just go across um, like you might do on a flight um, with BA. You We actually hop down to the Azores, then you go from the Azores over to Bermuda and maybe have a night there, then you hop across again. So you right. kind of break up the journey a little bit to make it a bit safer. That's fascinating because, it, you know, th there's something that most people wouldn't even think of when they when they see the jets. And I don't, there's no in-flight entertainment because you're going so fast you've got to be on the ball anyway, haven't you? So it's not like you can plug in your your iPod and uh, and get on with it. But Yeah, uh, I mean, there's sometimes plenty of in-flight entertainment happening as you look through the cockpit, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. But, yeah, there's... Um, I mean, the longest flight I did was eight hours. And that was an operational mission, dropped lots of bombs, fired the gun, and, you know, was in the thick of it supporting the army for eight hours straight. And there's no toilet in the aircraft. There's no kitchen. No. There's no films, you know. So the sort of flying you, you, you're doing, you're so involved. You, you, and it's incredible how quickly the time passes. But mentally, that must... can be quite fatiguing. Yeah, I was going to say, mentally, it must absolutely drain you when you get out of there. You must be exhausted if you've you know if you've been in theatre, you must be exhausted. You are. Um, you do get used to it. I remember there was a a passenger I'd, I mean, when you take passengers flying, you generally give them a um, you wouldn't expose them to a, a anything extreme because they just wouldn't enjoy it, and you obviously wouldn't ever take a passenger on a you know on, on an operational flight, but no. just some passenger trips around the UK, and you say, well, what do you want to do? And they, well, we'll do a loop or something like that. You wouldn't try and pull nine G because it would be horrendous for them. So you do a fairly benign sortie, maybe a bit of sightseeing. There's normally a reason for a passenger trip. Maybe you're taking someone from the army up. There's always a purpose. It's not just you know a joy yeah. ride, but you'd. You try and make it fun for them. You try and make it enjoyable. But invariably, when you landed after what was inevitably a pretty benign flight, you'd lift the canopy up and look over your shoulder at the passenger in the back, and this person would just be, <laughs> oh, you know, shattered. And they kind of climb out of this thing and want to sit down as soon as they got back onto the ground. Because it's such a – flying a fight is such an exhilarating experience. It's It's intense. Yeah, it's from a sensory point of view, from a risk point of view, from a, a physiological point of view, you know, the forces that you have on your body as well, quite apart from the fact that the, the whole world's rushing by at Mach 1 and, and you, you know, you're making these constant decisions and you're in this little tiny piece of metal hurling around the sky. So it, it is tiring. You do get used to it. And you notice that when your passengers were tired and you think, well, I felt absolutely fine. I could go for a run now. And you realize that, you know, you've been trained to this point where actually you're, you're quite resilient. But some of the operational missions were hugely mentally demanding, especially the night ones. And you'd, you'd go to the airplane. Would have, I mean, the first thing you do is brief the sortie and that would take an hour or so. And you go to the aeroplane, but from when you're putting in all your your, your kit, your G suit, your helmet, walking out to the jet, your pistol, all of that, and getting in from the time of walking to getting airborne, that's almost an hour. You're then in the jet for maybe seven to eight hours, um, in you know hugely complex, intense sorties, and then by the time you get back inside again, that's probably another half an hour after you've landed. Then you're debriefing the sortie, which takes a couple of hours writing up reports. So the whole cycle is is long. And after some of those um, challenging trips, I'll just go back to um, get a bit of food after landing and, and go back to bed and just crash and think, oh, I'm absolutely whacked. You're just physically drained and you're absolutely mentally drained. Um, but it's compelling. You know, it's 
it's exhilarating and um you're part of this 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 intense team that's supporting each other as you're going along so there's something that's electric about it as well it's not it's not like a really draining day in the office. Yeah. I have one of those today where you come <laughs> back and go, God, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> it's not that sort of tiredness. It's like a different type of um, of, of exhilarated tiredness, I guess. Can you can you imagine though? I mean, I, I I can just about drive a car, but can you imagine the the pilots from a, a Spitfire, Second World War Spitfire? Uh, what how they would feel now jumping into a typhoon and experience because it's like night and day the, the the speeds and the it's the same it's got to be the same concept because you're getting an aircraft off the ground and you're going through all those emotions but it's almost like steroids isn't it you've, you've it's tenfold what the speeds that you were, they were going um yeah yes you know the comparisons are really interesting and i'm reading a really interesting you know, fascinating book at the moment about um, a First World War pilot's experience. And they would do six months over in France. And that was it. You know, if you got your six months done, you're, you know, well done, you're back to England. And reading this person's experience, now his war was fought at 100 miles an hour. But the intensity and the risk, oh, yeah, you know, that, that that person went through you just cannot compare it to no. anything that people are going through these days. And I mean, the the mortality rate on this squadron um, in World War One in 1918 was unbelievable. It, um, people, you know, Blackadder used to joke about the 20 minutes, and you know, if you, people life expectancy was three weeks, but these are all true. Yeah. Um, so. You know, I think, you know, you, you, you're coming about the Spitfire. Yes, the Spitfire would. I mean, actually, some of the quick Spitfires would do 400 miles an oh, hour, which right. in 1940 is incredible. Yeah. And they didn't have the benefit of um, advanced flight control systems <laughs> to protect them or GPS to help them navigate. And so I think, you know, the skill that they had um, in those days was absolutely phenomenal. And I think, sure, they'd get into a typhoon and be amazed at the array of sensors and the complexity of the computers um, and the accuracy of the weapons as well, which is something else, because we can we can pretty much guarantee to put a weapon exactly where you want to at a time and place if you're choosing now, with a 99 you know percent, ninety greater than 99 percent chance of doing exactly what you want, exactly when you want, and that's something in the world you know World War Two that they just couldn't do. If you want to take out a factory in World War Two, you had to put up 200 bombers. And, you know, you lose 20 on the raid and they'd shower the whole area with weapons and you might get a few that hit. Well, now you could send off two aircraft and they could drop eight weapons and do it all in one go. So, you know, the whole world has moved on. But yeah. that generation, the risk that they faced and the um, the mental sort of impact that they that they saw is incomparable really to the experiences that we that we have yeah. today and it you know, i struggle to find the words really of just admiration and um you know respect to what they all had to go through and what they did oh absolutely i mean we're, we're littered with old rf stations where i where i live and it is absolutely it's phenomenal the work that went on and we're talking about modern history I, I'm, I'm that much older than you um I was born in 65, but that was 20 years after the end of the Second World War. And that's such close proximity to now, if that makes sense. It's just, yep. it, it's unbelievable how um, air warfare has has evolved with, with the weaponry, et cetera. But the, the, the few um, in the 1940s, they, they were unbelievable, the work that they did, and with the amount of training that they had to do it. How? What's also interesting is the evolution of aircraft. And um, in 1940, you had a Spitfire, but five years later, you had a Meteor. Yeah. And a Spitfire, in a, you know, the Mark One Spitfire was a pretty basic bit of kit. It didn't go that fast. It, it you know, it's still hugely impressive and makes hearts flutter at air shows, you know, when you see yeah. these things. But the, the early model Spitfires were fairly basic. But then within a decade... You know, had people trying to get the sound barrier. You had jets flying around. Yeah. The RF had the Meteor in service, which was, um, you know, a twin-engined uh, bomber, fighter, 
it could go 500 miles an hour and it's horrendously dangerous it killed a huge amount of people um but the the evolution of technology and you know people are flying their jets around now at similar speeds to the meteors that were flying 70 years ago now they can go quicker these days but there was that you know huge exponential change in a few decades in the early parts of 20th century where you went you know go before the first world uh, second world war you got canvas airplanes yeah we started the uh, first world war i think the american air force only had two military aircraft in 1914 and then 30 years later you know you, you've gone incomparable so that the, the pace of change in that with with aircraft is has been amazing and i think what we've seen recently or over the last um, you know, a few decades, they have got quicker, sure. And, you know, you had things like the Blackbird, the American spy plane, it could do Mach 3. Yeah. But most of the time, fighters these days are flying around at 500 miles an hour. Well, they were doing that 50 or 60 years ago. What you've got really inside the cockpit is a much more uh, clever computer network helping you now. The weapons are more accurate. There's been a much, uh, you know, there's been a much more clear drive towards safety in aviation that there wasn't so much in the 50s where I think the risk, you, know, you had this World War II generation that, yeah, flying's risky, so so man up and get on with it. Yeah. Whereas now so much effort's put in towards not losing aeroplanes, you know, for very good reasons and managing and mitigating risk. And so the whole flying world is, you know, moves along a different, um, accelerates and, you know, uh, uh, and has different focuses at different times of its evolution. So it's very interesting. You see, you, you're talking about the airstrike uh, situation, which we'll, we'll come on to. I was, I was talking to um, a, a guy from the Green Berets and, and his job was he would go forward to within, they'd literally, they were pathfinders, effectively pathfinders, and they would go within a few hundred metres of the target and they'd pinpoint the target with a laser and then... The, the weapons would would be dispatched, and and it would be nobody else. There'd be no collateral damage. It would be just that that factory, that tower block, that whatever it may be. And it was absolutely fascinating, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So you're you're talking about a thing called uh, close air support, which is where, and that was really um, what we were doing in the typhoon over in the Middle East was supporting ground troops, and if you imagine. Um, you know, half of Iraq on the eastern side, all up the northern border and into Syria was one great big front line of activity. That's a huge amount of territory where you've got fighting going on, mm. you know, all along it um, a great a great amount of the time. And you've got a very limited amount of aircraft to support that because fast jets are expensive, air forces are relatively small. And what you know the concept is that you only you only use the air power when you need it and so we would generally be called to support situations where the army don't actually have it under control or they're at risk and as, as you were saying about um your colleague in the green berries who was calling in airstrikes because they wanted an, an effect that an aircraft could provide that probably is you know a small group of soldiers in that instance couldn't mm. and often we we're called in when um the risk to friendlies had got to the point that their lives were now at risk. Right. Um, and so you would be dropping weapons in extremely close proximity to friendly forces a, a lot of the time. And when it when the friendlies are within the blast radius, if you like, the frag radius of the weapon that you're dropping, um, that's called a danger close drop. And you talk about it on the radio. So you'd be over the top of the situation that was happening on the ground talking to the soldiers they'd be talking about what was happening what needed to happen um normally there was pressure uh because the situation on the ground was deteriorating rapidly and they needed a weapon dropped or um you know uh, some enemy dealing with um quite quickly and if that wasn't done quickly and efficiently they themselves would be under risk their lives would be at, you know at risk and so you're in a very intense moment there where you've got to act quickly you've got to get uh, the weapon into the right place because all around you are, are um, civilian structures that can't 
be hit. There's collateral damage implications as well to sort of third party buildings and things that you don't you don't want to accidentally hit for all of the chaos that that would cause. And so you've got to get this thing down very quickly into the right place at the right time and obviously uh, avoid every pilot's worst nightmare, which is the blue on blue, which is where you've ended up killing your own troops. Yeah. And so very young pilots, I was in charge of the squadron, but we were sending people off day and night um, for these long trips where they were doing this every single uh, mission. And people would be flying these trips six or seven or eight hours, coming back. The next day they'd be doing planning and briefing. Then they go again. And then they'd have a day on the ground planning and debriefing. They go again. And this is, they'd be doing this for months on end. And so I was just hugely humbled by the performance of the pilots on the squadron that did this. And uh, we dropped hundreds of weapons out um, in the Middle East. Uh, they all worked. They all hit their targets. There was no collateral damage and there were no civilian casualties. And I was just blown away by the professionalism and, and expertise of the young guys, people in their in their 20s who'd come straight through training and been immersed into what was a hugely complex you know, and challenging situation and done it incredibly well. And that that relationship with the soldier, um, you know, was was absolutely at the heart of that. And some of the most heartening moments were when you would talk to the people after and they would say, well, this has happened and we we're grateful that that happened and, you know, it all worked. So, yeah, it was, it, it, it's an intense um, use of, of aircraft, that particular mission set that you're talking about and, and you know, one that we were involved in for, for quite a long time. I mean, the adrenaline that must be flowing when you're actually on your way to to use your weapons and it's it, it, I can't even imagine... I know what it's like to go on a blue light run. I know what it's like to be in a, in a vehicle. We were during the London riots where you're getting thrown around to different places, etc. But to do what you guys did is absolutely amazing. And there's an irony here, Mike, because you're calling these people the young... But you were, you were only 35 yourself, weren't you? You're not even that. I was, yeah, I was 35. Oh, you, you weren't exactly I an know, old man. I'm in my Come 40s on, mate. now, and uh, it's all, you know... But um, I think you're right. The, the, there was a lot of adrenaline, but what there wasn't at all was uncontrolled emotion. So... I bet there's some real parallels with blue light runs into riots in terms of the emotions that you're feeling. Uh, one of the things that the training, the the fast jet pilot training system is very eager to get right is that you need a real degree of composure and people that can't contain their emotions properly are whittled out of the system because yeah. um, the other thing is you're in the plane by yourself. Now you might be in a formation of two two aircraft and we'd normally go off as a pair or sometimes as a four um, for these types of missions. Normally you've got someone who's leading more experience making the decisions. You've got someone who's the wingman who's essentially playing a slightly supporting role but is probably much more inexperienced. Um, occasionally you get two very experienced pilots together then actually it becomes a little bit easier. But you're in the plane by yourself and generally it's you talking to the soldier, you're doing all this. Um, and the other aircraft is is supporting, maybe doing some radio calls, keeping on the fuel, you know, whatever they need to be doing, and watching out for threats and things. Um, so there is adrenaline, but I think w what you get quite good at is um, containing that emotion and thinking with a really clear head. Um, sounds a bit cheesy maybe, but trying no. to be a bit icy cool about it. Um, because as soon as your emotion runs away, and you've probably seen this in your past life, um, as soon as emotion um, starts running away in a situation, that's rarely a good thing. And so you find that the, the, the sort of your average typhoon pilot's pretty good at, at keeping control of themselves in those situations. Yeah. And, and it would need to get pretty extreme for people to get excited. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I went to a, a, a seminar, I suppose, with uh, Sir Clive Woodward, and he calls it the teacup moment, thinking clearly under pressure. Yeah. And and it really does. You, there is no room on a carrier. There's probably and there's certainly no room in an aircraft when you're doing it. You know, Mac One um, for emotions and flustering and all the other things that come with it. Because if the panic sets in, one it unnerves people, 
And if somebody starts to panic, it, it's, it can quickly ripple through the other people involved in the, in the operations. Um, but it's dangerous to the others as well. You know, they, they become a danger and a liability. So, no, that's really interesting. But the – how did you progress? I, I know we're going back slightly here, but you've, you've, you've become a trainer. You've, you've trained Typhoons. How did you become the squadron leader? Because, um, I mean, that's such a – you're a young man now, but to, to achieve that at such a, an early stage in your life, how did that all come about? So I was uh, the, a Jaguar taxis instructor, then luckily moved across the Typhoon when it was coming in and then did a couple of years uh, as essentially the taxis instructor on the Typhoon. But we were all learning together, really. And so I remember my squadron boss said, right, we need close air support procedures writing for the Typhoon which is the mission set that we've just been chatting about. Yeah. And literally sitting at a computer with a, a blank Word document and thinking, right, well, here we go. And then you're using your experience from um, before. You're using the experience of other pilots around. We had Mirage 2000 pilots and American F-16 pilots. And there was an awful lot of experience, um, but nothing on, on the Typhoon. And it was a case of taking all of those inputs taking the good ideas, nutting it out sometimes because um, fast jet pilots generally are quite strong-willed and generally think they're <laughs> right and they can't all be right. So navigating all of that, and not just for the air-to-ground role, actually, but I had a, a really close colleague, a guy called Will, who was doing the same for the air-to-air, -air, and we sort of sat opposite each other, and there was a small team of people involved in all of this. But, but writing all these procedures down and, and, and exercising those, so going around the world, um, lots of time in the States and proving the system, basically training people, proving that it works. And that went well. And after that, I was promoted. So I'd, from being a flight lieutenant to the rank of squadron leader, which is confusing because you're not actually in charge of a squadron at that point. Right. Um, you're in charge of a, a flight, which is a kind of section of a squadron. But right. promoted that. And then I was off to the training unit on the Typhoons where I taught um, basic flying and the tactics instructor course. And also um, the RF has started employing um, or training Saudi pilots because the Saudis were buying the Typhoon. So we had a kind of overseas flight as well. Gotcha. So training all, all the youngsters really and the new guys onto it as well as um, training up a new cadre of tactics instructor on, on the new aeroplane. And that was a great time, really enjoyed it, working with some fantastic people. And I really enjoyed uh, teaching as well at that point because I'd been flying, I guess, for – about a decade at that point, um, including all the training flying. And I've been on the front line for about four or five years, so I had a little bit of experience. Um, and it was nice then to take on a little bit more of a management role where you're helping other people and maybe having a little say in some policy decisions and how things should be done. So really enjoyed that. And as part of that, um, I led the Queen's Birthday Fly Pass in 2009, which was great fun. And that was leading a, a, a formation of typhoons um, in a diamond, six of us, and then behind us we had, um, God, uh, VC-10s and tornadoes and all oh, sorts of wow. aircraft. I think about 30 in total with the red arrows at the back. They used to form up at the back power. of our house. They'd form up coming down the A-12 and, and, and we used to watch them go through from, from wherever it was down towards the A-12 and into London. It's yeah, I don't amazing. remember the A-12 being a nav point, but I do remember um, <laughs> uh, we formed up over, uh, over North Norfolk, over the wash there. And yeah, absolutely, don't, flying down over Essex and then you turn right and go into London. Yeah. And I remember thinking, I wonder how easy it is to see Buckingham Palace. And the, the thing is, actually, when you're flying in from, we're about 1,200 feet, I think, I can't remember exactly, but you're quite low. London's obviously full of uh, high rises. Now, the mile is, uh, I don't know how long that is, half a mile. Buckingham Palace isn't that high. So when you're the outs outskirts of London, you can't see where you're aiming at all. Um, and you can only really see it from the aircraft when you're about a mile away from the mile. Um, it's it's all Fantastic. happens late. And then you're like, OK, thank God I'm on I'm in the right place. So we had a GPS in the aircraft. So as long as that worked, <laughs> that, that, that will help us. We had to get there to the second, which was, you know, took a little bit of planning with all these aircraft. Um, but that all worked. But they, they gave you a flight before the Queen's Birthday fly past in a helicopter where you flew the route in a helicopter just to 
just to do it beforehand okay in case your aircraft navigation system just went out to lunch and you're suddenly then leading all these aircraft dozens of aircraft behind you you needed to have a rough idea of how to get across london visually and i remember sitting in this helicopter at the front and i had a really early digital camera because iPhones hadn't been invented um, and taking pictures. And I remember thinking I needed to fly over the Barbican and it's the three buildings. I remember it thinking like a cricket wicket. <laughs> I need to fly over the leg stump of the Barbican flying on a, on a heading, a specific heading, and that'll take me there. So I've got all these land sort of features lined up such that if on the day the, the nav kit didn't work and the the other thing is fast jets are not as reliable as cars i mean luckily my car outside generally starts every time i get into it fast jets are nowhere near as reliable you always have these little system failures and and bits of kit that don't quite work and that's because industry only ever builds a few of them so you're almost in pre-production models of right. cars you know so they're not quite as reliable as you might think they're not as reliable as um airliners to take you on holiday so it was in the back of my mind i was always thinking god if the map fails and the gps fails this is i don't want to be the first pilot to have missed the queen <laughs> um, but luckily i didn't and it was all all right but that was good fun oh I, I can i can only imagine we were there when um i think it was the golden jubilee and concord was in in the fly pass i mean it was oh, you're it, showing your age there I, but yeah, well, I, I, but I am old mate so that's you can <laughs> you, you can tell by my hairline but um but yeah it, so, uh, yeah it's fantastic so yeah, did did that tour and then went out to Afghanistan after that and did a ground job out there where I was a liaison officer working alongside the very um, people you were talking about earlier on the ground. Um, and I was uh, went out there as a fast jet expert, I guess, to to work with the soldiers on the ground, the, the forward air controllers, and just be a point of contact between the air and the land. I did six months there. How was that, um, though? Everyone else is flying off and they're, they're on the sorties. And how, how are you? How did you feel about that? Uh, putting on a flak jacket and carrying a rifle, it, it was an interesting time. And uh, I, I wasn't exposed to the same level of risk that the, the soldiers on patrol were. Um, so I, I learnt... I mean, I'd rather have been flying, I think, because yeah. that, that I enjoyed it. But it was a really interesting experience to be on the ground out there. I learned a lot about how the army works and the risks that the young soldiers face out there. Um, and that stood me in, in good stead. I think, you know, it's only when you look back on your career that you think all these little pieces that you did, you know, kind of turn you into the person that y y you were. Yeah. And, you could you can look back and draw on these experiences you know at different times and so it, it was a very interesting period um i mean looking at how afghanistan's ended up it's just hugely disappointing um the amount of effort that went into stabilizing that but you know the, the air force doesn't choose the army doesn't choose to go to war these are all political decisions made by the governments and you do what you're told you go out you do what you're told and then you come home when you're told to come home and you know, it's a shame that the politics, I think, really is struggled in that part of the world. And yeah. um, there are awful consequences that we're reading about in the newspapers now. And and the, the issues out there have been going hundreds of years. Nobody's ever, ever, you know, no foreign force has ever taken on the Afghans and actually been successful. But we were the closest. You know, that was... Well, I think it, it got to a point where you had a very small footprint of troops out there in the order of very low thousands across a yep. number of nations and really uh the violence had pretty much stopped and it yeah. was being contained and and troops were being trained up their air force was being trained up there were a few bases around girls were back in school yep you know now whether it's right or not to try and impose a, a sort of western view of the world on another country is is a question for a different podcast but in terms of security and stability there, there was a good effect that had been achieved in the end and um that's obviously all been torn up now um but yeah, I mean, I've got lots of colleagues who are very upset about how that's all ended. Yeah, and I, I, but yeah, that was my experience in Afghanistan, and I came back from there. Then I worked um, for the deputy commander of the air force, so second in command, and I was his personal staff officer. So he'd go to all the meetings with him and take the notes and do the actions, and flew around with him in helicopters and things for two years, and that was a very interesting time. Uh, meeting lots of senior people in NATO and ministers and um, getting exposed to really how the Air Force is run at a strategic level. Um, so good good staff training there and 
just some some good interesting um uh exposure really to the politics sort of yeah almost government level politics of how big decisions are made um and away from the tactical world of flying airplanes and so you, you kind of you know switch the telescope around if you like and you looked at it from the other aspect which was which was interesting um so i did that then i did a residential course for a year did a master's uh got promoted and then then i got in charge of one squadron after that so that was a sort of route to one squadron and what one squadron i mean I, I, i'm a i don't know a great deal about them other than what i've read in order to prepare for this and their history goes back to the first world war that's and and everything well, and, in, and beyond it's the oldest flying um unit in the world is it really? military flying unit in the world wow it goes right back to um balloons in 1878 i think is when i think they were called number one company if there's a history buff listening i'll probably get corrected <laughs> they were called something like number one company royal flying corps and it was when the military first started to use balloons to try and you know get into the sky to observe what was happening wow. and that was their lineage back then and then they then um as soon as world war one kicked off they then got equipped with airplanes I think three squadron, annoyingly, were the first squadron to actually get equipped with aeroplanes. Right. Um, and one squadron was hot on their heels, kind of packing the balloons away and getting into their sock with camels or whatever. But yeah, it, it's the oldest flying squadron in the world and with a history that is, you know, immense in every single major, you know, conflict that the UK, air, air conflict that the UK's ever been involved with. One squadron's been involved, you know, yeah. right from World War One, World War Two, Falklands, you know, you name it, sewers even, they've they've been there, and so then to be able to sort of lead out one squadron for that new operation out in Iraq and Syria, that's huge. 20, it was a huge moment, yeah, huge. I, what I find interesting, and you, I'm not sure you'd be able to answer this, but why on earth are the RAF headquarters, the original headquarters, in the Strand? Is it because the Savoy is just down the road? Because it, it, 1918 was when the RAF was actually formed, wasn't it? And yes. the, the actual building is, I think it's 82 or 52, the Strand, and which I find quite amazing. And I noticed that because I was on a London bus, number 11, going down towards Trafalgar Square, and we got held. And there's a blue plaque on the wall to commemorate the fact that the RAF, that was the first RAF headquarters. Well, I didn't know that. You so, go. you know, every day's a school day. <laughs> I, I think um, the army headquarters was, was in a place called the Old War. Well, it's now called the Old War Office, but it was obviously just the War Office when they had it there. Yeah. And that was in central London. They had the Admiralty in there as well. So I guess they thought, well, with a new service, we want a building in London. Yeah, close to. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why, why, why that building in the Strand. Yeah, when, I, when I was in the RF headquarters, was up in High Wycombe. It's still there now. Oh, okay. And... Um, yeah, that was one of the big headquarters. I think it was Bomber Command um, in World War II, but I, I, you know, I might be wrong about that. But they've had a headquarters there for decades, right. and now that's where the Air Command headquarters is, and it's all run from there these days. And they've got a big bunker there, so all all the services have got their headquarters, you know, around around the UK, and then they've got the MOD, the Ministry of Defence main building, which is where all the joint you know, forces, if you like, where the Army, Navy, Air Force all put their representatives in with the civil servants. And that's right. where the whole thing's kind of centrally run from these days. So scary moments. I mean, there, there must have been, flying at those speeds, there must have been times where you're thinking, oh, my life, I, I hope I can get home from this. But, you know, what are the outstanding moments for you that will, will be your, part of your abiding memory? Uh, I think... You're right. Every uh, fighter pilot has used up several of their nine lives and, and had a few lucky escapes. Um, I think one of my earliest ones was flying the Jaguar at low level at night. And we used to fly down at 250 feet, at 500 knots. So that's pretty rapid. Um, and without really any sort of computer assistance whatsoever so you'd be flying on night vision goggles which all they do is take the existing light and illuminate it a little bit and i remember flying through the hills at low level into deteriorating weather there was no moons there was no uh, light 
There was no cultural lighting, which is the light of street lights and houses up in the highlands. Um, and I just got a little bit disorientated and I rolled out on what I thought was the horizon, I remember. Um, and it wasn't. It was actually the bank of a, a, of a mountain. And I was about 45 degrees off what I thought was level. And then the whole world didn't really make sense. And I remember um, a, a, we had a warner when you got too low, a rad out warner that was set at 250 feet. And this thing suddenly pinged. I remember the rad out decreasing quickly and in front of me, I just remember seeing this rocky outcrop and I uh, outcrop. I can distinctly remember seeing these cracks in the rock in this sort of what looked like a tree and just pulling back with all my might on this airplane and just zooming away straight into thick clouds and up through the highlands and just pleading that I didn't hit a hill on the way up and I didn't. And I sort of popped out of this cloud at about 8,000 feet and I was uh, a second away from going into the hills and I suspect a lot of Jaguar pilots have had similar instances with that. But that was just a training one. Um, operational moments, I had to strafe, which is where you fire the machine gun um, at low level. And I remember it, it, it was over near Fallujah, so there was lots of people on the ground, kind of built up area. There was a, a lot of threat from um, handheld um, infrared missiles and machine guns and that sort of thing. And we'd already been uh, dropping weapons in this particular area, but I had to then get down very close to the enemy and and fire the gun from very close range. And that meant getting down to low level. Um, now I was going very fast and uh, it, it was all fine, but I remember feeling hugely vulnerable at that mm. point as I was low over the ground by myself thinking one bullet here that goes through and takes out the engine and I'm ejecting into the arms of people that I really don't want to be ejecting into. No. And I remember my heart beating so hard against uh, you wearing this tight sort of jacket. And I remember that just thinking, God, I hope I don't have a heart attack. I remember <laughs> at the time, just the blood pressure must have been off the scale. Um, and actually, I almost had a mid-air collision over Iraq at night as well with a, a tanker aircraft where um, we were just flying in a circle over a town. There'd been a couple of drops and I was looking down sort of in a left-hand turn down through the canopy. Um, and my whole vision just went blank for a minute and just something passed right in front of the aircraft. Um, and I lost all vision. And then I looked back up and, and thought, God, what you know, what on earth was that? It was pitch black, nothing to see. Um, and your mind, like your world slows down. So you're probably thinking in milliseconds now, you know, what, what was that? I thought, it, could it have been a missile? It wasn't lit up like a rocket, so I didn't think that – it probably wasn't that. It could have been another aircraft. But I, I then rolled into a left-hand turn to look where this thing had gone to, and I looked right down the back of a tanker aircraft, in, you know, in a view that you've got normally when you're about to plug wow. behind it. So it had been in a left-hand turn. I'd been in a left-hand turn, and I'd missed its wingtip by inches, you know, no, nothing. And I, I remember getting into – um, got on the radios and we found out who it was and the air traffic controller made a mistake and put us both into the same part, part of the sky at the same height at exactly the same time and we just almost hit each other and wow. um, it hadn't been picked up on the radar they don't have a radar there are, there are some systems you can use in peacetime when you're flying around in the airways um, that deconflict you but for various reasons operationally you don't turn all of that on Right. Yep. so we didn't have that protection and so we just missed each other by a whisker and there, the the pilots and their aircraft heard the noise of the jet go, you know, right past them, which shows how close it was. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting one. So I've had a few. You've had a few. <laughs> now, uh, before I go on to – you were awarded the OBE in 2017 – what was that? What was that like? I mean, it's it's a uh, it's fantastic, and you're such a young person to. Some people will never get one, um, but you're a very young person to receive that. But what was that like when when they told you? Because you get told a little bit before the the announcement. Yeah, they 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 tell you, then they say you can't tell anyone. But, you know, <laughs> for a few days before, she's so kind of keeping this thing quiet. Um, I mean, it was it was lovely. It, it was a huge honour. I guess it's. Um, fantastic to to be recognized in that way and i was just really delighted with it um we went to buckingham palace prince william uh, awarded it um my mum was there my brother was there 
uh, and my daughter was there with me as a team. And then we went out and had a lovely dinner afterwards. And it was just a fantastic day. You know, it was it was great um, and, and a huge privilege to have received it. So, yeah, lo- lovely thing to have got. I mean, and I got it for all the work that we, we did out in Iraq. And um, one of the other guys on, on the squadron the following year got an MBE for, um, you know, for his contribution as well. And I, you know... <laughs> I was more pleased for him. You know, it, it's a strange thing, really. It's the team that, that earns these. And there are 130 people that went out and all did a brilliant job. And, you know, I, I was absolutely delighted to get recognised. But really, it was everyone that earned that thing. And I, I always feel that, you know, whenever anyone mentions it, it was the whole team of people, all the engineers, the intelligence officers, you know, the pilots, the suppliers, all of the IT guys, all of those guys and girls. It was such a team effort to get that. And, you know, there were some awards that came out of it, but it was a team effort and uh, just immensely proud of, of, of the efforts of everyone else, really. You're a very humble man, Michael Sutton, I'll tell you. It's, <laughs> it's, it, it, I, I think it's fantastic. Now, we, we, what about your heroes? You know, you, you, who were your heroes that pushed you into this direction or that you looked up to in, you know, in, in life? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Sometimes I get asked what my favourites are and it's a bit like a favourites question, isn't it? And I'm really bad at favourites um, and pinning it down. But I think I joined the Air Force, not really because I wanted to follow in any particular person's footsteps, but out of a vague sense of wanting to do something good for the country, um, having watched a few war films and things like that and and a sense of patriotism and also um you, you know that the prospect of an exciting career i think as i got more into it and and read a bit more around people who've been successful in that world you then pick up on um you know pilots you find inspiring i guess two i'd mention um Robin Olds, who is probably the most famous fighter pilot in America. Um, and they, to this day, and actually, bizarrely, I'm in touch with his daughter because he was in charge of one squadron for a very brief period in the 40s. He was an ace in World War II wow. as an American in the UK. He then did an exchange in the RAF on one squadron. And for some strange reason, he ended up being the boss for a, a period of time. So he was the only American at the time to have ever commanded an RAF unit. And he then went on to uh, be uh, an ace in Vietnam. And he was probably the Vietnam fighter pilot. He oh. was big, brash, married a um, Hollywood film star, lived life to the full, had a great big moustache, always out on, on you know, partying. A fantastic pilot who everyone just revered and respected. And he had this of its era approach to flying that you just think that, you know, if you can bottle that, um, absolutely fantastic. And the thing that I, one of the things I really admired about him, apart from the fact that all of the pilots admired him, was that um, his team, his broader team, his engineers really liked him as well and really respected him. And sometimes in the flying world, you get this divide between the officers and the men or the pilots and the engineers. And that's something that I always really wanted to minimise. And um, I wanted to run the squadron flat um, where the, the most junior, newest person could talk to the most experienced, oldest person with good ideas and talk on a level. And the military doesn't really like levels. It likes hierarchy for various good reasons. But I think there's an awful lot to be gained from having an environment where people can talk openly to each other. And I think Robin Olds espoused that, you know, in, in you know, armfuls. And, and so he became a real sort of um, I've learned more about him since I've stopped flying fighters, really. But, you know, an, an incredible man. And we got in touch with his daughter um, who, who visited the UK and visited the squadron. And, um, you know, I think that was that was a lovely moment because she does a bit of a speaking tour about her father. So he was one. And strange enough, a guy called Keith Park, who there's a statue of him in London. Um, and you might, you know, someone that a lot of people even... Um, you know, sort of history buffs or air force buffs don't know too much about, but he was in charge of the Battle of Britain as a as an air marshal, um, and he was fought in the trenches in World War One in the army, and he then went on joined the RAF, and then he rose up the ranks and was very senior, and he ran the group, which is the sort of you know 
organization of, of fighter pilots in in the Battle of Britain. He had his own aircraft and he in the daytime he'd be doing his staff work and running the battle. And at the end of the day, he'd fly this thing around the various bases, land and say, how did it go today? What are your issues? And he talked to people and he connect, he managed to connect with people on a really personal level such that, um, uh, you know, young engineers or senior pilots would absolutely admire this person for who he was because he had everyone's best interests at heart as well as being, you know, hugely talented in his field and being very, very gifted. Unfortunately, he never quite made he, he, the very top because I think in some ways he was muscled out by other big characters who are more political and less talented. And, you know, you see that, don't we, in the wider world today. Yep. So Park went from doing a blisteringly good job, um, you know, into sort of slightly backwater jobs and other people then, you know, took glory and, and, and moved on up the RAF. But I think um, a few more Keith Parks, um, you know, would be a good thing for the world. And he's, he was a Kiwi, actually, by birth, but an extraordinary man. And... Um, hugely respected, hugely talented and, uh, you know, well loved by his people. And I, this is the thing people say, you know, as a leader, it's it's isolating and, you know, you've got to make tough decisions and you're not going to be liked. And I, I really believe that there is a middle ground to being a leader where, yes, occasionally you do have to take tough decisions and occasionally people aren't going to like what you have to do. And that's part of it. But most of the time there's a room where you there's space where you can talk to people, you can talk to junior people, you can take stuff on board, you can explain stuff. And, uh, you know, oftentimes if you explain the reason why you're doing something or the pressure that you're under because of, you know, various competing factors, you can really get people on board because often people have got, you know, an opinion because they don't have all the information. And I think both of those um, sort of gifted pilot leaders were, you know, really impressive individuals. Uh, that's fantastic. Now, th- a big topic of of military and emergency services, mental health. I think that personally, I think that the acceptance or the understanding of mental health within organisations is far better now than when I joined the police in 1986. Um, what are your experiences of that within the RAF? Uh, I'd I'd 100% agree that it's better. I'd say it's uh there's still room there's still room to go um when i joined uh which is in 99 um mental health wasn't really even ever mentioned um when i left it was something that was mentioned a lot and so i think that was a good thing um i've had some pretty awful first-hand experience i've had two great friends and colleagues that have committed suicide during their time in the air force when they stopped flying um and you know yeah aw- awful um that that's happened and since you know there, there have been more and i think the suicide rate in the forces is significantly higher than it is in general society and that's undoubtedly because of the pressures that get gets put on people due to a variety of different factors i think you know below that that sort of extreme impact there's also a level of pressure that gets put on with just moves time away from family um, exposure to sights and sounds. I'm sure it's the same in the police that, you know, in a normal work, walk of life, you don't get. Um, I've got huge admiration for what the army did and, and um, the pressures that, that those individuals had to cope with, particularly in Afghanistan and Iraq. And there's the instances of PTSD and things there are, you know, it, it lurks. And, and I think one of the the interesting things is that this stuff doesn't come out initially. It can sometimes take years to come out when when people aren't in the services. I think when you're in the services as a regular, there are a lot of um, there's access to a lot of support on base and 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 with sections that can help you. When you leave, there's very little. You're sort of thrown to the NHS, and and there are some fantastic. Um, uh, solutions out there but often people get missed and the NHS can be a bit hit and miss I think you've got a charity sector that really stepped up um, the, over the last 20 years with help for heroes and combat stress and fantastic organizations like that but really I think you know some people who are very proactive or maybe have got supportive families um, can get help but I think there's a lot of people out there who don't get help um, maybe don't know who to turn to or they're struggling by themselves 
Um, and when they've left the forces, that's it, they're on their own. Um, so I think, you know, mental health is great. It's getting a bit more attention. There have been some great initiatives um, and some fantastic charity work. But I think, um, you know, we're, we're only really at the beginning of that journey still. Yeah, I agree. And I think some of it is around value because the difference, there are a number of differences between the police and the military, and I would never try and compare them, you know, like for like. But we retire after 30 years, for instance. So we've already carved our way through life. We haven't got those stresses of and strains of having to start by buying a, a property or, you know, getting on the ladder. And we're a, a lot of young service personnel, um, they've, they, you, you leave at 40. You've done your 22 years, you leave at 40. All of a sudden, you're starting again. And you're not always, you haven't got that camaraderie wrapped around you either. You could be going into some job in Civvy Street that you may not enjoy because you haven't got your mates around you. And I think that those pressures come to bear quite considerably as well. And, yeah, I've, I have. I've had a couple of mates who have decided to um, take their own lives and who were in a military background. And that, that's, you know, it's so sad. Um, I think some... I think, yeah, I think everyone dips when they leave the military because yeah. um, especially if you've done, you know, long enough to get vaguely institutionalised and that it's, it's, it's not just a job, it's a way of life yep. and it's your friendship group it's a structure, it's a routine, you know, it's, there's a reward to it, that there's all these things. And um, I think it was, it's either Prince William or, or Prince Harry um, that said when they left, um, it was like getting off a bus, a des deserted bus stop and the bus with all your mates in it. And uh, you just stand there and the bus drives off with all your mates on it. And there yeah. you are. And I, I mean, I thought it was quite a neat analogy. And I, I, I felt it a bit myself when I left the Air Force. And I joined a company now with quite a lot of ex-military people working. So, you know, there's a there's a bit of a sense of culture there, which I, you know, which I can relate to, which so I'm very lucky. But yeah, you, you, you're whipped away everything that you know, and you're into a completely different um I mean, some people struggle to even know where to live. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, it, you are really starting again quite often in midlife or early midlife. And, uh, yeah, your, your social network's gone. No one's organising summer balls and all these nice things that you enjoyed. <laughs> it's all gone. So, yeah, I, I think everybody struggles a bit and some people struggle a lot. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's where we step in, you know, with the, with the recruitment side. We're, we're trying to pair people up at the moment. Um, with different roles, and it's to give people that value. But so, what are you doing now? I mean, you're an author. You've written um, a book called Typhoon, um, which is available on Amazon and all the other outlets. Waterstones, everyone's got it for sale. What was that like writing a book? I mean, I think it's fantastic. I, I, I wish I had the ability to do it. But what was that like to see your name? Up in lights. I saw that you were you were signing your books in some branches of Waterstones, etc. How was that for you? It's been a really fun project, and um, it it was lockdown really. Um, lockdown, lots of time on my hands, and I'd kept operational diaries from when I was flying, and I thought nothing more than that these were pencil scribbles. So every night I'd gone to bed, wrote a little bit. And um, during lockdown, I thought I'm going to write these up onto a Word document so that it's just there. And, uh, you know, when I'm dead and buried, one day my daughter might actually read them. And I just thought I'll just uh, I'll just type it up really for posterity. But it grew, it grew and grew. And then uh, I, a couple of friends read it and said, oh, keep going. Then it, it turned into a book from that. So it was the whole typhoon experience and then bolted on a, a, you know, a bit about training and things and how I got to that point. And fantastic. then, yeah, luckily it got picked up. Um, and then I got a fantastic editor in Roland White who um, has written Vulcan 607 and some other great books. He's He works at Penguin as one of their directors. And so he took it on as the editor. Um, and then, yeah, it was published in November uh, last year, well, 21. And so yeah, it's been awesome to have that on the street. So I've really enjoyed that. And then as a result of that, I've done some talks and some cadet talks and some podcasts, and it's opened up a whole new world, actually, as well. And I, I wouldn't call myself an author. I think that's a bit grand. But yeah, I mean, it was great to write the book. And it and it, um, it was quite cathartic as well, because it, it made you go through things in slow time and really try and understand your feelings. And 
and the book's called Typhoon, but it's not a spotter's book about an aeroplane. It's really, it's about that whole, it's about that whole experience of what it's like to be sat on the end of the runway, getting buffeted by the wind with an eight hour, you know, mission in front of you. And it goes to all the thoughts and feelings and considerations, the kind of corridor conversations that people have. So you, you really get immersed into this hidden world of, of what it's like on a, on a combat unit and the pressures and the teamwork and all of that stuff as well. I've really tried to expose all of that with it. And um, so far it's had a really great reaction, which has been fantastic and some nice reviews on Amazon and all the rest of it. So I've been really pleased with that. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, I, I looked at your reviews and I thought, wow, yeah, this is this has been so well received and uh, long may it continue. But so, <laughs> so what are you doing now in, in the private world? You, you walked out, you handed the keys back to your aircraft um, yes. And what, um, what are you doing now? I wanted to get flying again. So uh, after finishing on one squadron, I, I did a strategic planning job in the Ministry of Defence, which was doing crisis and contingency response um, and contingency planning. And, and uh, it was, I did that for two years and thought it, it was interesting. We did some good work there, but I thought I don't want to do this for the next 20 I mean, the Air Force, when you've run a squadron, that's your flying days done. It's a bit of a, a, a travel agent. You can't really go back. So, um, and also I was, I mean, not, clearly not old, but I was 40 and I thought, well, I can't go back to being 21 again. I'll go and do something a bit different. And so I got the commercial pilot's license. And then um, I'm still in the defense world, though. So we fly, I've worked for a company called Draken, and we fly modified business jets. Um, and we've just got some uh, a small fleet of fighters actually as well, and we do electronic warfare and radar jamming and all that sort of stuff, working with the Air Force and the Navy and, uh, and NATO, and we fly these jets um, at ships and at aircraft and pretend to be essentially the bad guys and the enemy, and we're a training asset now. And so we'll fly around the world and do that. And so I, I do some flying and I do some management, and, and that's my new job. How much fun is that? I mean, you, you, from someone who's gone from philosophy to flying around the world pretending to be the enemy. I mean, that's that's a huge. That's fantastic. It's great fun. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good job, and I'm very lucky. And we've got um, about fifty fifty ex military uh, sort of percentage uh, wise. So we've got civilian pilots as well who we train up and teach them all the skills, and then we've got um, people who come off the front line and uh, fancy this and have a bit more of a stable existence. And so, yeah, we take, um, we had an ex-Tornado pilot join recently. So yeah, and, and so we get a bit of crew room banter and a bit of culture that we all know from before, which is nice, but also, you know, at weekends we're at home and we're not away and the evenings are generally free. So it's a bit more of a normal existence as well, which is great. Well, do you know what, mate? I'm absolutely, I've got to say I found, you absolutely fascinating what you what you've been talking about this evening. No, I ha honestly, honestly, I have. I, I, I really. Everyone I've spoken to so far, everyone's got a story, but and but and everybody's fascinating. But yours is particularly fascinating because it's not something that we experience. How many how many fighter pilots are there in in the RAF? You know that's that's the that's yeah, the reality. Fifty, probably something like that. And out of sixty-six million people in the UK, you know that's that's what we went to. Um, we went to Buckingham Palace. We're very lucky to go to Buckingham Palace to a, a Christmas party, and Her Majesty turned up, and there's like forty people there, and I had to pinch myself because we were forty people out of sixty-six million, and this is what I'm talking about. You know that a yeah. hundred and fifty people. In the UK, fly fighters, and you're one of those, and I'm and I'm really, really grateful. <laughs> no, it's a great pleasure, and uh, thank you very much for having me on the podcast, M Michael. Thank you, Mike. Uh, please send our love to your to your mum, and I wish you every success for 2023. But before you go, is there anything you'd like to add, alter, or correct? No, no, absolutely not. No, it's been a massive pleasure, and uh, thanks very much. No, Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I'm very, very grateful. Take care, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.